Hello and welcome to Nightcast. My name is Jonathan Reyes, Knights of Columbus Senior Vice President for Communications and Strategic Partnerships, and I'll be your host from here at the St. John Paul II National Shrine in Washington, D.C. Here on Nightcast, we hope to help you step into the breach as men, as Catholics, and as Knights. You can find this episode and all episodes on demand anytime by visiting kfc.org slash nightcast. You can also find Nightcast on Knights of Columbus social media channels, including YouTube. In this episode, we'll be talking to the Supreme Knight about the new Knights 150 strategic plan. We'll also be looking at the latest Knights of Columbus Marist poll on Americans' opinions on abortion, taking a look at the next generation of Knights, and much more. Thank you for joining us. During a recent Board of Directors pilgrimage to Mexico City, the Supreme Knight renewed the consecration of the Order to Mary under her title of Our Lady of Guadalupe at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Here's a look at this important moment for the Knights of Columbus. Today, the family of the Knights of Columbus comes to our mother, our Lady of Guadalupe, to reconsecrate ourselves, to reconsecrate our beloved order to her maternal guidance. Mother of the civilization of love and mother of the Knights of Columbus, pray for us. The consecration 22 years ago this day has really been a gift that has rippled out through the entire order to all the countries where we're established. But it's even gone beyond that, and I would say it's broadened devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe throughout the whole world. Viva Jesus and Viva Cristo Rey! I'm joined now by Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly to talk about the renewal of the consecration of the order to Our Lady, as well as the new Knights 150 strategic plan. Mr. Kelly, thanks as always for being here. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. So a number of things to talk about, but the first one I want to talk about is pretty exciting. You've recently returned from a trip to Mexico City with the Board of Directors, where you reconsecrated the order to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Why is that so important for us as Knights? And maybe you can tell us a bit about that trip. So I have to say it was so great to be in Mexico City and to be at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is really, you know, in many ways is the spiritual heart of Mexico. It was really important uh, for me to go there with the board of directors to reconsecrate the order to Our Lady of Guadalupe. My predecessor, Carl Anderson, first consecrated the order to Our Lady 22 years ago in the Basilica. And so to be there and to reconsecrate the order, I felt it was very, very necessary to just renew that consecration, to put the order under her mantle of protection, under her mantle of maternal care, uh, because I, she's so important to this continent, to, the, to, to really all of the Americas. She is patroness of the Americas. And so as knights, I thought it was very important for us to do that. You know, one of the amazing things about Our Lady of Guadalupe is not just that she had this message of consolation, but her apparition actually led to the conversion of all of Mexico and continues to lead to conversion. So I just think it fits perfectly with so many of the things you've been saying, Mr. Kelly, about the knights also as being out there to bring the gospel to the rest of the world. Yeah, that's right. I mean, she's patroness of the Americas, right? And so we are, as knights, we're so strong in Canada and the United States and in Mexico. So I think, you know, for that reason also, it's, it's very important for us to be under her mantle. So we're coming up, we're approaching what is the 500th anniversary of the apparition. And given our close relationship with Our Lady, I'm sure we as knights are thinking about doing something special. I wonder if you could say something about that. In 2031, we'll be at the 500th anniversary of Our Lady of Guadalupe, 500 years since she appeared on the Tepeyac Hill in Mexico. And what we're looking at is a, is a nine-year intercontinental novena. 
to Our Lady of Guadalupe. We'll be talking about this more in the future as we firm up our plans, but I'm very excited about it to really, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a nine-year devotion to Our Lady that leads us to this, this really important event, the 500th anniversary of her apparition, which, as you say, Jonathan, really led to the conversion of an entire continent. Well, I look forward to hearing more about that on our next Nightcast, and we'll, we'll certainly keep viewers informed as that unrolls and gets unveiled. Let's take up a second topic that I think was a very important event for the Knights in a number of ways just in the last couple of weeks here. It was the unveiling, the launching of what's called Knights 150, which is the strategic plan for the Knights of Columbus going forward. This was a really important moment for the Knights of Columbus, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that. It was a very important moment for us. And, and what this strategic plan does is it gives us a roadmap uh, to plan our activities and to really think about how we approach the next decade. So the name of it, Knights 150, comes from our 150th anniversary, which will occur in 10 years. So what this does is it gives us a way to think about our vision and our mission and then also have a plan for really kind of pushing our mission forward. And it gives, us, it gives us a way of organizing here at the Supreme Council how we're gonna work and how we're gonna really, really organize all of our efforts. I, I've said it in the past, but the Knights of Columbus is a, very, is a very complex organization. So when you have that, you really need a plan. You need, you need, a, you need a plan to focus your energies and focus your attention. And that is really what Knights 150 is all about. It's, about. it's about making sure that we are true to our mission and that we work in an organized way to achieve that over the course of the next few years. You know, I know you worked with the board. I know you worked with senior leadership. I know that, that a lot of thought and energy went into this. But one of the things that really stood out to me was this clear articulation of mission and vision that I just think is so important. It captured exactly what Blessed Michael McGivney has always had us doing. And I thought maybe right now what we could do is turn to a video you made where you explain that mission and vision and we can just take a look at it right now and then after that, we'll resume our conversation. When Father McGivney founded the Knights, he tackled the most pressing challenges facing the Catholic family and the church. And in the principles of charity, unity and fraternity, he gave us timeless ideals that can help us address society's most pressing needs. Each generation of knights has answered the call issued by our blessed founder with courage, faith, and leadership. In our early years, when young men were losing their lives in factories, we cared for their widows and orphans. When anti-Catholic bigotry reared its ugly head, we showed that we could be both proud American citizens and proud of our Catholic faith. We deepened our leadership in the 20th century, raising the banner of patriotism through two world wars. And for the past 50 years, we have led the way in service for the sake of others. From providing coats for kids and food for families to strengthening Special Olympics, from supporting seminarians to ensuring that families have financial security, and from rebuilding Christian communities in the Middle East to standing strong with the people of Ukraine, we have proved in powerful ways that wherever there's a need, there's a night. We should all be proud of what we've done, and you have my deep gratitude for contributing so much to our work. But we should also ask ourselves, where do we go from here? After leading for so long in so many ways, where is God calling us next? Our future success firmly depends on our fidelity to Father McGivney's vision for the order. Our mission is this. The Knights of Columbus empowers Catholic men to live their faith and serve their family parish, community, and country. This is who we've always been, and this is who we must continue to be across everything we do. 
This high-level statement of purpose is filled out by our vision, an articulation of what we are and what we strive to do. Our vision statement reads, Founded by Blessed Michael McGivney in 1882, the Knights of Columbus is the premier lay Catholic men's organization. Guided by the principles of charity, unity, and fraternity, we build lifelong relationships with our members and families. We are multi-generational and international. We offer formation, mutual aid, and financial security to members through our charity, products, and outreach. We aspire to invite every man to join the Knights of Columbus and to extend our charitable reach as widely as possible. So I think you did an excellent job laying out the mission and vision, and that's helpful to the organ whole organization for the next 10 years, all of us, every member, everyone who wants to know the Knights, even people who aren't Knights, they can see what we're all about. Uh, one of the priorities, which I think is extremely important, is the Knights should seek to become first in faith as in charity. Now, that's really interesting. I wonder if you could comment on that. The Knights are known for our charitable service. We do so much on a local and a national and even international level for charity. But where we want to go is we really want to form our men in their Catholic faith and give them opportunities to grow in their faith. This is an area where uh, we know that men are very hungry for this kind of formation. And so what we're doing is we're giving men the opportunity through the Knights of Columbus to, to grow in their faith. I've talked in the past about our core meeting, which, which is many of our councils right now are in a pilot program but it will allow our councils to have meetings at the parish for the men of the parish, not just knights, but for the men of the parish to come together to grow in their faith. So this is an extremely important initiative, and we've already begun uh, in, in this way, and, and, and many of our knights will, uh, will know this. I mean, with our Into the Breach video series, we've already started this, but over the course of the next year, we will be putting out another video series on marriage and family life. And we're currently working on a Bible study for men that our councils can take up in the context of the core meeting. So this is why I think uh, that, that, that priority for, for the order to become first in faith as in charity is something that's really going to push us to, to really grow in our faith and really be be in service to the church even more uh, than we always have been. Exciting times. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for your leadership. Thanks for spending some time with us and sharing your vision. And I look forward to the next chat we have on Nightcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Ahead of this year's March for Life, the 2023 Knights of Columbus Marist Poll on Americans' Opinions on Abortion was released. The survey showed that post-Roe, a majority of Americans continue to support legal limits on abortion. Let's take a closer look at this important poll. For 15 years, the Knights of Columbus Marist Poll has consistently found that a pro-life consensus exists among the American people. Six months after the Dobbs decision, recent poll results remain encouraging. It shows that nearly 7 in 10 Americans support at least some restrictions on abortion. 91% support the mission of pregnancy centers. 78% of Americans oppose using taxpayer dollars to fund abortions abroad and 60% in the United States. The results further show that 77% of Americans believe medical professionals should be able to follow their conscience when it comes to abortion. These are encouraging signs in this new phase of the pro-life movement. When it comes to the direction of government policy, a growing consensus of Americans are in favor of greater protections for the unborn. The Knights of Columbus will continue to stand for the dignity and worth of every human life. I'm now joined by Knights of Columbus Vice President of Public Policy, Tim Sakosha to talk about these latest poll numbers and the cause for life. Tim, thanks for being with us. Good to see you. You too, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. So maybe we should just start with saying, what is the Knights of Columbus Marist Poll? Just give us some background on that and why it's so important. Sure. So the Knights of Columbus have been partnering with the Marist Institute for Public Opinion based at Marist College in, in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, for about 15 years now. 
And what we've been trying to do for the last 15 years is to really do a deep dive study into what Americans' opinions on the abortion question really, really is. So, for instance, we know Gallup and a lot of other great polling outfits, they do these polls. We see them regularly. There's always one coming out. Are you pro-life? Are you pro-choice? Uh, what we found over 15 years is that's not really answering the question of where most Americans are uh, on this very critical and, and deeply dividing issue. Um, and what our polling is actually finding is it's not deeply as dividing as sometimes uh, we find. So we start with that question, but we go deeper. And we ask uh, questions about particular policy, questions about particular limits, questions on uh, state issues, federal issues, and so that we really now start understanding what Americans think. Uh, and, I, and I think it's critically important because that's not how this issue is often reported. And so we're able to add to that discussion, we're able to add to um, an intelligent way to the debate so that we actually are, are talking from facts and not just presuppositions uh, on the issue. So, Tim, I've heard you talk about this before, and you've mentioned something, you've used this phrase, pro-life consensus, and you said this has sort of been steady throughout. What do you mean by that, and what does it tell us about the last 15 years? Sure. So, after, after we ask that initial question of, of whether a respondent is pro-life or pro-choice, what we then ask is, okay, well, here are six uh, possibilities for policy on, on the abortion issue. Uh, which one comes closest to your opinion? So, we ask, you know, do you think it should be legal without limit? that it should be completely illegal. And then we ask a few questions in between as well. We call it our six-way question. And what we've found consistently over the last 15 years is that if we draw a line around uh, whether someone thinks there should be limits on abortion starting at three months or in extreme cir circumstances like the life of the mother or, or other such issues, we find that that number comes in at or above seven in 10 Americans. So this year, 69%, just about seven in 10 Americans would favor policy that limits abortion to the first three months of pregnancy or only in extreme circumstances. But our pro-life and pro-choice question indicated that about 60% of Americans or so uh, call themselves pro-choice. So what we're saying is, is that this isn't really answering the question on where the American people are, but that there's actually a pro-life consensus uh, that most Americans kind of are, are innately leaning more in a pro-life direction on policy uh, and that we, you know, we, we bring this up to our legislators, to the media, to uh, to our brother Knights, to the American public, to let them know that, you know, really there's a bit more nuance to this issue, this issue than we're hearing about. Uh, and so we start there, um, and then we start diving a bit deeper. What does this really mean? So we ask questions about uh, federal policy and other issues like taxpayer funding, where we find 60% of Americans don't support taxpayer dollars being used uh, to fund abortion. So this would be the federal Hyde Amendment that I'm sure a lot of brother Knights and listeners have heard about before uh, that, that restricts uh, funding for abortion in the labor, health, and human services space, so Medicaid and, and other such programs like that. Uh, and this is something that is popular among the American people, but not maybe something that we hear about as often. So this this consensus we know really kind of goes to the core of where the American people are, not just Catholics, not just Republicans, not just independents, but really a bipartisan consensus on the issue. Did the Dobbs decision change any of this? I mean, we, we, we put Roe versus Wade aside. Did that change your polling? You know, I, so for this year, it didn't. In fact, actually, our numbers are about the same as they have been, again, being very consistent or better. Uh, we ask a question about whether laws should seek to protect the unborn child and the mother uh, where possible. Typically, that's come in very strong, the, the low uh, 80, 81, 82 percent. This year, it was over 90 percent. And so there, there are a lot of other numbers that have increased the taxpayer uh, support that I mentioned before. Um, have, have gone up as well. And so what we're finding is it's consistent or even a little bit better. This strikes me as particularly important now, Tim, because as the conversation gets more emphasized at the state level, we're not abandoning the federal level. There's a lot to be done here. But now that we're having state conversations about these and state marches, which I want you to talk about a bit, tell me why it's so important we participate in those marches and why this information is now so important at the state level. Yeah, I mean, so... Practically speaking, things are important at the state level and the federal level because what the Dobbs decision d did in its own words is to return the issue to the people's elected representatives. And so that's state, federal, it's even even in some areas where there may be opportunities, local, uh, municipal uh, situations as well. Uh, but at the state level, you know, there uh, the states can um, regulate the medical profession. And so there's a lot of responsibility there on state legislatures to do that. Uh, some states have responded in a in prolific direction. Some have um, responded in a way to expand abortion. Uh, and so then that also gets to our to, to the two issues you mentioned. One, federal need. There are there are federal issues um, like taxpayer funding 
uh, which has the support of 60% of Americans on domestic, uh, over 70% when you go to international funding. So there's a federal role there for sure. Uh, but at the state level, we need to make sure voices are heard. And so, of course, we've marched in Washington now since 1974, uh, and we'll continue to do so. But marching at the, at the state capitals is important as well as state legislatures consider, consider these uh, these legislative questions. Uh, but there's also a cultural kind of moment to it as well, to let legislators and red states, blue states, purple states know that people care about this issue. They care about it. They're pro-life. Um, and they want their elected representatives to know about that. You know, I think it's important you bring up Washington because there was some question, and you and I had these conversations with a lot of our friends, about what's going to happen to the March for Life here in Washington after the Dobbs decision. After all, as you said, it was primarily a response to the Roe versus Wade decision. Were you surprised about what you saw here in January? Uh, I wasn't. I always had hope that it would be one of the biggest and uh, most successful marches uh, in history. And I think it was, uh, you know, the march was started in 1974 in response to Roe. Uh, the organizers, you know, thought it might just take a couple of marches uh, to, to change the tide. There were talks of constitutional amendments in the earliest days after Roe. Uh, and, and of course, that didn't happen. And so the march really became an opportunity uh, to change hearts and minds, to, as the, in, in the words of the March for Life, to, to unite, equip, and mobilize the pro-life movement. Uh, and so that that's what the March for Life has really become, a rallying point, an opportunity to come together, uh, to, to look around and to see other people who are uh, concerned about this issue. And so that's that's the role of the March now, kind of after Dobbs, post row, uh, to continue to change hearts and minds, to, to build uh, unity. But it's in January. And so then we can go forth into the states during the rest of the year uh, to bring that message into state capitals. And so the March for Life uh, organization has organized uh, now upwards of 10 state marches and over the next five or six years hope to be in all 50 states in the District of Columbia uh, as well to be able to uh, advocate for life and to speak out for life. The Knights of Columbus has long had a presence on college campuses in the U.S. and Canada, but also around the world. Many young men join the Knights in college and our work there offers an important insight into the mission of the Knights and our future leaders. Here to talk about our important work with this next generation of Knights and an important recent event attended by 17,000 college students is Nicholas Holloman, Knights of Columbus Manager of College Councils. Nick, thank you for being with us. Great to be with you, Jonathan. Thank you. So maybe we could just start by talking about how many college councils, about the program, what you do. Why don't you just give us some background into the work of the college councils? Sure, be happy to. So I am Nick Holloman. I'm the Manager of College Councils for the Supreme Office. Um, a lot of people are unaware that we have a college councils program until they encounter some of our college nights or one of our college councils. But we do, in fact, have around 150 active college councils in the United States and Canada. Um, we're actually worldwide, as, the, as is the order we have in total, around 300 active councils all over the world, including the Philippines, Central America, um, and the U.S. and Canada, of course. So our college nights, really, they're, uh, they're Knights of Columbus, just like you might think of at your local parish. They're carrying out the work and the mission of Father McGivney on their college campuses all over the world. And really, they're, they're a strong source of brotherhood on their campuses for college nights for young Catholic men who really are, are living in sort of a hostile environment for, uh, for young Catholics. We hear a lot about the rise of people who have no faith or don't believe in anything transcendental among young people. But here we are, the Knights on these campuses, and we're actually growing. Tell me about why are people coming to the Knights? What's what's making it attractive to this next generation of leaders? Sure. I, I think you're right that we've we've heard a lot about the rise of the nuns, so-called, not N-U-N-N, but N-O-N-E-S. Um, and I, I think he, that, that may be true in a lot of cases. A lot of people have sworn off organized religion, especially on college campuses. But when you do that, there is, there's still a yearning in the human heart for, for that, uh, for the mystical and for that which is God, whether you acknowledge it as God or not. So, I think there's, in a way, there is uh, a certain searching that you just see in general among young people, and some, I think, oftentimes that's misplaced. But in terms of young Catholics and our college nights, they're because their peers have turned away from religion, they're turning in on it much harder and much more fervently. Um, and with a great deal of passion for the faith and excitement. Um, and just as Father McGivney had a great deal for souls, I think you see that a lot uh, among our young knights. Uh, and I think it's precisely because the culture is is pointing them in the opposite direction and they're turning back towards the faith. 
So uh, you and I had the privilege of seeing each other at a pretty important event this year. It's an event that gathers something like 17,000 young people, I think, were there. It's called SEEK. It's sponsored by the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. We've been sponsors for for a number of years. These are good friends of ours. We have a booth there. So tell me how you experienced the Knights of Columbus presence at this big gathering of Catholic college students. How were we thought about? What did you hear people who came up to the booth say? Did we meet some of our fellow Knights? Did people join us? Tell us about what happened. Sure, sure. Yes. So we did have a booth at Seek this year. And I'll say our booth was very popular. We were so busy at the booth, I really didn't get away to go to any of the talks, which is is a good problem to have, I suppose. But yeah, I would say the mix of folks that approached us at the booth were, it, it was probably a good half and half, either guys that, that were college knights uh, and they know who we are and they love us. But then on the other hand, uh, those that were college knights, uh, a lot of them don't really know a whole lot about us. So this was a good opportunity for for a number of young men at the conference, I think, to have a first exposure to the Knights of Columbus. And and I think really, especially among young people, there's sort of a misconception that we're your father's or your grandfather's organization. So really, what a great opportunity this was for us at Seek to, to change that perception and to challenge that perception, um, especially when these young men see their peers, many of them who are college Knights, who are Knights of Columbus, uh, gathered together there at Seek. Is there any particular perception that you say was the most surprising to people? So they'd come and say, tell me about the Knights. Was there one or two things you said that just sort of blew them away? Like, I had no idea kind of thing? Was there anything stand out? I think the biggest thing that stands out is um, when people learn about our founder, Father McGivney. They're really blown away. And, and young people especially are attracted to the Knights of Columbus precisely because of Father McGivney. Um, and that might shock a lot of people. You might say, well, what do have, what have college kids in 2023 have in common with a priest that was around in the late 19th century? But, but actually, I think his story is really inspiring to them. If you think about it, he was a young priest, and he was living at a time when all of these Catholic immigrants were coming to the United States, and they were facing a lot of uh, resentment. They were in a really hostile environment, and, um, and he wanted to keep them in the faith in an environment that wanted so desperately to pull them away from the faith. Uh, I think that resonates a lot with college students, that story, because they, they too, are in the same sort of environment. Uh, maybe the tactics of the devil are a little different today and a different on the college campus, but, uh, but the end is the same, to pull young people away from the faith. And so when they learn about Father McGivney, I think they see a connection to his challenges. That's great to know, and we continue to pray for his canonization, and we'll keep doing that. You know, another thing we were able to do with this was to show some of the resources we produced— to help young people pursue Christ, to help everyone, frankly. Uh, Into the Breach, which has been out for a while, but we get to feature it at an event like this, but also the new Mother Teresa movie that's now been out a couple months, but I know a couple hundred young people came to see it. From my experience being there, people were impressed by these. Did you get a chance to talk to anybody about Into the Breach or Mother Teresa? Yeah, so uh, certainly Mother Teresa was very popular. The doc- the documentary was shown, I think, on maybe the second or third night of, uh, of the SEEK conference. And we had about 300 attendees uh, show up to watch the documentary. So it was very popular. And I think it drove a fair bit of traffic and interest to the booth. Um, and, and of course, when they come to the booth, they find you know various things that we have to offer uh, the, as far as formation materials go into the breach being one of them. And of course, that's something that, that young college nights and that students in general are, are very interested in. Um, this year, we made a big push to give out the Vivat Jesus prayer book. So that was something that had an incredible response among folks that showed up to the booth. For those that are listening that may not be aware of, of what that is, it's a sort of a daily prayer planner for Knights of Columbus, and really for anybody that picks it up, to be honest. But but the idea is that it helps you to build out a really intentional and structured and a regular prayer life. Um, so it's a real it's a great value to our Knights of Columbus, I think, and and especially encouraging them to pray daily and to pray consistently. So Nick, if I'm watching this and I want to join the Knights on a college campus, or maybe I'm a parent and wants my son to like look into the Knights, where do I go to get more information? Sure thing. Yeah. Just give us a visit at www.kfc.org slash college, or you can shoot us an email at college at kfc.org. We're pretty easy to find. Uh, If you take a look at our website, you'll get a really great overview of what college Knights are doing. We have a lot of great videos highlighting various programs and activities that college Knights are doing. Uh, but yeah, get a hold of us in either of those two ways, and uh, we'd be happy to help you start a new college council on your campus or to uh, help you get your son involved in a local college council. 
Well, Nick, thanks for taking time. Thanks for the great work you're doing. We continue to pray for the success of the College Knights. Thank you, Jonathan. Viva Jesus. At the end of 2020, Joseph McGivney, a relative of Blessed Michael McGivney, experienced a health crisis brought on by alcohol abuse. Facing the need for 24-7 care for the rest of his life, he instead experienced an incredible recovery, a recovery he attributes to the intercession of Blessed Michael McGivney. Let's take a look at his story of return to health and faith. When I look at where I was before, fear was just a big part of who I was. I just kind of stopped going to church. When COVID kicked in, that desire to drink just really took over my life. The company I worked for closed every office, and my way of coping with all of that was to drink more. My body just completely surrendered. He was all disoriented and he collapsed. I decided to take him to the emergency room. I didn't really know what to expect. Even though he was able to speak, he's not forming coherent sentences. I didn't know if he was able to operate on his own. It was horrifying. I spent a few weeks there being detoxed from alcohol. Most folks come back out and that didn't happen for me. My health had reached a point where I was psychotic. Joe's aunt, Aunt Cherry, she's a nurse and she would relay things back to the doctors and nurses for me. They didn't think he was going to recover. And they diagnosed him with Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, which caused all these neurological, physiological effects. He was hallucinating. He didn't even know who I was. You have to start looking into long-term care facilities because this is how he's going to be, probably, the rest of his life. They tried everything and nothing worked. A switch was flipped and I was normal. He kind of just showed up at the door, gave him a big hug, and it was just a wave of relief. Just a couple of days ago, he wasn't able to feed or to dress himself. How could this possibly be? I spoke to Aunt Jerry, and she started sobbing. She said, I prayed to Father McGivney to save you. Do I think that intercession is Father McGivney's work? Well, and in my heart, I know it is. Far as we believe is my great-grandfather was Father McGivney's third cousin wait a minute, I may be related to this incredibly saintly man. My belief in God suddenly became really, really important to me. This horrible life that I had suddenly found myself in and turning that over to his care sounded like a really good idea. I felt in that moment what I believe was his presence. His completely changed as a person. He seems to just be happy. He has a different perspective on life. My priorities now became my family, my faith. I decided to join the Knights. It is evident that these are people that put a high priority on serving others. Joining the Knights gives you the opportunity to do that. Seeing my dad go to these community service opportunities became something I could do with my dad. I became a member of the Knights of Columbus, and it's really inspiring and motivational to help in the community. The ability for me to honor Father McGivney through the works that are done by the Knights is really humbling and overwhelming. I previously spoke with Joseph McGivney, Brother Knight and relative of Blessed Michael McGivney, about his healing. Let's take a look at that conversation. Joe, thanks for being here today and taking the time. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I'm happy to be here. So tell me a bit about what your relationship with God is before all this happened and how it then changed. But give us just sort of a picture of life before the miracle. Sure. Um, you know, I was born and raised Irish Catholic, um, you know, was baptized for communion, confirmation. Um, so... I would say I was always a believer, 
Uh, I knew how I knew the words to the prayers. Um, but I, I, at that point in my life and into my adulthood, you know, when people would talk about, you know, having a real personal relationship with God, um, I didn't know how to do that. And as a result, um, you know, I was somewhat controlling, somewhat self-centered. And as, as I progressed through adulthood, um, while my belief in God never, uh, never ended, I, I just, I didn't know how to make a connection with him. I just didn't, didn't have that blueprint. Um, or maybe part of it too was because of my kind of selfishness. It just wasn't that important to me. Um, that all, that all changed obviously when I, you know, was, had that spontaneous, miraculous healing. And then soon after learned all the details of what had happened to me, uh, I had this overwhelming desire to create that connection. And um, I, I, I learned to do that um, initially through being a part of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, which, uh, you know, in a quick summary, there, people always say, you're, you know, your disease, your alcoholism will lead you to AA, but AA will lead you to God. And that's what happened for me. I want to ask you about Father McGivney in a minute, but before I do that, not everyone has a story to tell of a miraculous healing. And what I find interesting about your story is you don't actually remember this, the, the moment, the, the process by which you went through this amazing healing. But you knew afterwards you needed to develop a relationship with God. So to all the people who are watching this, who are maybe where you were before and just saying, you know, I believe in God, but I don't know him personally. What would you say to them just in terms of do these things or here's a way to, if you want a personal relationship with God, here are the steps, so to speak. Uh, and not because you need a miracle and not because yeah. you're even necessarily dealing with addiction, but just what are the steps to growing in intimacy with God? Well, for me, in my case, and I'll speak to my personal experience, um, it all, you mentioned steps, it all began with going through these steps in the uh, program of AA, the third one being um, made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God. Well, based on the brokenness that I was experiencing after learning about what the pain I had caused so many people, uh, you know, making that decision to turn it over to his care sounded like a really good idea. But I didn't know quite yet how to get there um, until a very kind therapist, um, you know, had was in the facility where my awakening occurred. As I was being discharged, she said, Joe, you've, I'm going to pull up something on my screen. And she Googled surrender prayer and up popped this very long prayer. She said, Joe, promise me you, when you get home, you'll print this prayer and you will make it a part of your everyday life. And at that point, I, I, I said, I'll, I'll do that. What, what, you know, I'm thinking, what do I have to lose? Because obviously everything I've done so far didn't work very well. So that surrender prayer over time became just a part of who I am. And my, I finally started to feel that real relationship. And I started seeing and learning over time that if I just had the strength to s surrender it all to God, that all these beautiful, wonderful things just kept happening in my life. And, you know, to this day, that surrender prayer, um, and then that process of surrendering it all, all over to God is a part of my everyday life. Um, in, in my world today, when being human, when I start to become selfish, when I start to become anxious, when I start to get sideways, as I say, um, that surrender prayer, I, I may pull that one out three or four times in the same day. And it always brings me back to this, this feeling of peace 
and and you know frankly it's my life has been so filled with joy and wonder since i turned it all over to god um i only wish i had learned all that, how to figure that out decades ago but here i am today and so grateful so grateful that i have that uh, that relationship now so Father McGivney, obviously of interest to the Knights and all of us, is a big part of this story. I wonder if you could just tell us in brief, um, what's his role in all of this and what's his continuing role in your life? You're a Knight, your son's a Knight. Um, you're talking to a bunch of Knights on this show. Tell us about Father McGivney and what he means. Well, I mean, f for me, and um, it, it, there's no question in my mind, no question that Father Michael's intercession led to where I am. And the, the way that came about, um, after I had had my, my healing and I'm now trying to figure out how to live my new life, um, it, it became really important for me to start serving, you know, serving others. And I knew of my connection to Father McGivney. Um, and so I decided uh, to join the Knights after all these years, and soon after, um, I was having a conversation with my aunt Jerry, who was the nurse again that had quarterbacked my care. And Jerry it, had a particular devotion to Father Michael. And in our conversation, I, I, I you know, was very excited. I said, "Jerry, I, I, guess what? I just became. I signed up to become a member of the Knights of Columbus." And she. You know, I was expecting her to be really happy. And all of a sudden I hear, she started sobbing. And she said, Joe, you have no idea um, how, how overwhelmed I am with joy. She said, because when you were sick, uh, I was praying to anyone who would listen, but I was praying devoutly to Father Michael. She said, in fact, we were on a phone conversation. She said, Joe, I'm looking at his picture right now. So what Father M Michael is, has meant to me and continues to mean to me, me today, um, I, I believe he is a very powerful intercessor. Um, each day I pray, read that prayer, you know, right from the prayer card right here. You know, I read the Father McGivney canonization prayer, and I now have a kind of very ongoing list of other folks that need a miracle that I pray for. And I pray that Father Michael will intercede on their behalf. So that's, you know, Father McGivney is a part of my everyday life now. The Knights of Columbus have produced a new documentary film titled In Solidarity with Ukraine. It follows the organization's immense humanitarian efforts and support of the people of Ukraine following the Russian invasion in February of 2022. The documentary can be viewed on ABC-affiliated stations across the country through a partnership with the Interfaith Broadcasting Commission. To learn more about the film, including where to watch it, you can visit ukrainefilm.com. Let's take a look at this important new film. It has happened. This is Ukraine's capital. What seemed unthinkable in the 21st century is now underway. The repercussions of this war, since they have displaced so many, will be devastating. I just hope that people who I love will be alive. Solidarity in the presence of the church is something that is connected to a global, universal community. I was encouraged by so many individuals and organizations coming together to help Ukraine. In prayer, we are united for the cause of the peace of Ukraine. The Ukrainian nation is undergoing such a tragedy. We cannot change those circumstances, but we can say, I am with you.
Each month, our Supreme Chaplain, Archbishop Laurie, presents a reflection and challenge for Knights to live during that month. The Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge is a great way for Knights to put perseverance into practice and grow in faith and fraternity. You can always find each month's challenge at kfc.org slash monthly challenge. And here's Archbishop Laurie to issue his monthly challenge for March. My brother Knights, for my Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge for the month of March, the scripture passage comes from the gospel reading for the Mass on Sunday, March the 5th. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We read these words often in Holy Scripture. Here Jesus speaks to the apostles, awestruck at his transfiguration. In a similar way, the angel told St. Joseph, Do not be afraid to take Mary, Mary who had conceived the Christ child, as his wife. The knowledge that God is with us should encourage and strengthen us. Sometimes, as with the apostles, we can be overwhelmed by the mysteries of faith. At other times, the challenges of living our faith in a secular culture seem daunting. Yet Christ continually empowers us as he calls out to us, rise and do not be afraid. For the month of March, during which we celebrate the feast of good St. Joseph, I challenge you to watch the documentary, St. Joseph, Our Spiritual Father, reflecting on St. Joseph's courage. Second, I challenge you to participate in the Faith in Action Pilgrim Icon Program, which features an icon of St. Joseph. As you undertake this monthly challenge, I ask you to reflect, what are you afraid of? Do your fears prevent you from fully following God's will in your life? How can you imitate the courage of St. Joseph? God bless you as you undertake this monthly challenge. Vivat Jesus. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Nightcast. Once again, you can find this episode and all episodes on demand at kmc.org slash nightcast. You can also find Nightcast on Knights of Columbus social media channels. Also, if you have thoughts, suggestions, or comments on Nightcast, we'd love to hear them. Just send an email to nightcast at kfc.org. Thanks again for watching. We hope you can join us for the next episode of Nightcast. Viva Jesus.